Describe his remarkable power hitting center fielder as Joe Lewis, Yasha Heifetz, Sammy Davis Jr., and Nashua rolled into one. I say he was simply the greatest player I ever saw. He certainly transcended sports, revered by his peers, kids, and intellectuals, one of whom declared there were only two geniuses in history, Willie Shakespeare and Willie Mays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Willie, yeah. you're, in the, you're in the golden years of a golden life after a golden career. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to make you feel awfully good about everything you've achieved, everything you've done. Mm -hmm. and your life in general? Well, I think uh, one thing, Tim, is that uh, so many people have continued helping me do whatever I need to be done. Uh, I hear guys say, well, I wish I could have did this, did that. Well, I say, hey, I did everything that was in baseball. Now I got a life to live. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I try and help people now that uh, never had a chance to do what I could do. And, and I think it's, a, it's just remarkable how people catch on to what I'm trying to do. And it's just a, a blessing that I can still understand what I want to do. So uh, I'm just uh, honored to just even just be around and enjoy life. I played against you uh, for about 15 years. Mm. And when I came out of Memphis, Tennessee, I'd never seen anybody with a manicure before. <laughs> and when, yeah. when, I, when I caught behind you, the first yeah. thing I noticed in San Francisco in 1960 yeah. was you had a manicure. Oh, yeah. And I thought, this is unbelievable. Willie May is with a manicure? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, well, and I noticed the thickness of your hands and I also yeah. noticed yeah. your nails were done. Yeah. And I thought, I never had my nails. Of course, I was 18 years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you was 18 coming I was, in? I was 18, 1960, yeah. I was 18 when I signed. I was 19 when I came up, so I was, was right in the same area. You, you yeah. signed uh, back in 1950, I guess, right? Uh, 1950, I uh, came up in 51. Uh-huh. Hell yeah. Okay. But in 47, 48, 49, in Birmingham, mm -hmm. you were playing. I mean, when Jackie Robinson came into the big leagues in 1947, you were, what, 16 years old in Birmingham? Might have been 15 or Might 16. Because you turned pro when you were 14. Well, I turned pro a long time before that. You know, mm -hmm. it's just I never got the opportunity mm -hmm. to play with uh, guys in, like in, you know, Birmingham. I had to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee to get started. Uh, I went there for about a year and played there. And the reason I came back to Birmingham is my father had called uh, the manager, which is Piper Davis, at that time and says, look at my kid, he can play. So Piper called me and they played a special game in Birmingham and they put me at shortstop. And I said, how wait a minute. You, how old were you at the I was time? 15. 15. 15. And the ball came so hard, those guys started hitting the ball hard. You know, in high school, uh, the ball don't come that hard, you know, right. you can play. Mm -hmm. So the ball come, came so hard, I said, wait, hold it, back up. I said, let me go out to center field. So I went to Southern Field and I started catching everything out there, throwing everything out. So Piper said, that's your position. You're going to play Southern Field. I want to talk to you about Piper Davis, but, but first, when the Giants sent the scout Eddie down Montague. to Montague, Eddie yes. Montague, yeah. down, to, uh, down to Birmingham, mm -hmm. he, he actually went to scout another player, Alonzo Perry, right? Yeah, yeah. He came to scout Alonzo <coughs> Perry, and I didn't know he was there. Uh, we played in uh, what a University of Alabama uh, school is now. Uh -huh. I got four for five. We came back to Birmingham. I get three for four. And I didn't know he was scouting me then. Uh, I was told that he was working for not the Giants at that time, Boston Red Sox. Hmm. And the, the reason he quit the Red Sox, they wouldn't sign me. So he quit the Red Sox, I understand, and we came to the Giants and told Mr. Stone, I came to see Alonzo Perry, but I seen another kid that you have to sign. This is what they tell me. Now, I, I'm so young, I don't know about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So when they signed me, and uh, I guess they, they talked to the owner, was a Charlie Hayes, and said, hey, we need a kid uh, like, like Willie more than we need Alonzo Perry. So that's how they signed me. So the Say Hey Kid hits the big time in New York. Mm -hmm. And everybody in New York always remembers 1951. Mm -hmm. And I'll be back to talk more with Willie Mays right after this.
I'm back with the Say Hey Kid who took New York by storm, the most popular player in New York Giants history. Back in 1951, you were, you were going to move to San Francisco in six years. But what, it was, what was it like, Willie, uh, in New York in 1951? You're behind the Dodgers like in early August by, what, 13 and a half games? Something we're, like that. We're about 13 and a half games mm-hmm. uh, out. And Leo had a meeting, and he says, guys, we can win. You know how dramatic Leo was. You know, he could <laughs> uh, make you believe anything. He you could. Know? So, uh, luckily, when he made the speech, we, st- we went on a, a tear. We won about 16 or 17 straight games. I think we lost one at home, uh, two to one or something like that. But then we went on another winning streak. So Leo said, hey, we still can win this thing, guys. Keep going, keep going. So uh, they moved me from third to, uh, I think, six or seven because it was too much pressure you know, on me at that particular time. And I was young. That was my first year. Uh, when he moved me to seven, I started hitting, you know, a couple of home runs because the pressure was off a little bit. Mm-hmm. Bobby was hitting in front of me. So every time they walk in, bang, I hit a home run. So we, we, we did very well, you know, with his speeching. There's a story that you were next to your locker, in your locker, and Leo came over, and you started crying. Well, I was crying, and Monty and I were just sitting there, and, mm-hmm. and I started crying. You and crying. Monty Irvin. Yeah, Monty Irvin. So we, I started crying. I said, hey, Leo. Uh, Leo came over. and well, Actually, what I was told, my Herman Franks went to Leo and said, uh, your boy's over there crying. You better go talk to him. So he came over, and he didn't say a very a lot of words. You and my son and Fielder, you go home, you come back, you're going to play tomorrow, and you're going to play every day after that. It relaxes me. So uh, I told Spawn this, I tell Spawn all the time, I know you like me because you just grew one right in and he let me get a hit. He threw a fastball, he beat us three to one, but he let me get a hit, he he threw a fastball, which was uh, not that hard. But I hit a home run off of him, he beat us three to one. And like I said, when I went in the Hall of Fame, that was the first thing I said. You see that little bald head guy over there? (laughs) He the one that I'm here today, and that was funny. So we did very well with that. And that, that other ball-headed guy, why you were there, was, was Leo. Mm-hmm. He, he was more than a father to you, wasn't he, Will? Leo was a, well, how to put that? He was a mentor to me. Mm-hmm. When we went to L.A., instead of me staying at the hotel, I had to stay in this house. We, in L.A., all the movie stars came by, Pat O'Brien, uh, Dean Martin, all the guys came by. Uh, I was exposed to a lot, a lot of things for, through Leo. Uh, when uh, he adopted a kid with Chris DeRocha, you know, Chris. Sure. Chris was my roommate. Your roommate on the road, on right? On the road, yes. <clears throat> mm-hmm. and, and I said to Leo, why are you making Chris my roommate? Well, that's for a reason. So I didn't ask no more questions. So as we go into, uh, we went to Cincinnati and we went to St. Louis, Chris had to stay with me over where we stayed at. So now we eat cornbread, we eat chicken, we eat black eyed peas. Chris never had all this stuff. <laughs> so now he goes back to Leo and says, Leo, Dad, I don't like all this stuff that Willie had given me. So Leo, come over. What are you giving my son? What are you giving my son? I said, Leo, oh, I had cornbread. I had black eyes, please. Soul I food. had green soul food. That's what Jeez. I eat. Absolutely. So he says, uh, I want my kid to have a steak. I said, okay, give me 200 a day. We'll have a steak every day. <laughs> so that's how I got extra money from Leo because of Chris. So I said, Chris, go back and tell him again that you don't like this food. We'll get us some more money. So he did. Yeah. <laughs> we go. <laughs> That's a great story. We're going to talk more with Willie Mays. We're going to come back and talk about the World Series uh, uh, that year. And, of course, the two out of three playoffs, a shot heard around the world. Who was on deck when Bobby Thompson hit the home run? Willie Mays. We'll be right back with Willie right after this. back with the incomparable Willie Mays, and in doing research for this show, I found out that you thought Leo DeRocher was going to pinch hit for you if Bobby Thompson had walked oh, yeah. in 1951. Oh, yeah. I can't believe that. I've ne- I'd never heard that. Well, it, Leo would do anything to win a game. Uh, I, know, I knew that. And as I'm kneeling down on, on deck, I said, if Bobby gets on, Leo is going to pinch hit for me right away, and that's going to kill me right away. Who would have hit? 
I don't know if we had dusted that in or not. I, I, don't, did. I don't. If we did, that's mm -hmm. who was going to be the hitter. But no. four years before that, we talked about Jackie Robinson uh, breaking in. And in thinking about that and in seeing that one quote, you said, every time I, I look at my checkbook, I see Jackie Robinson. Yes, yes. That's, that's, a, that's a great comment and yeah. because he did so many things for African-American players. Well, right? before Jackie, I, I had three guys that I could talk about. That was Ted Williams, Stan Musial, and Joe DiMaggio. But we had no blacks in there. Mm -hmm. So I, when Jackie came in in 47, oh, boy, I have a chance now. So I said to myself, I am going to play baseball. I was, my best game was football. Then the second game was basketball. Baseball was my last game. It came and easiest for it you. It came easy because I, that's what I picked. I said I could play 20 years of baseball, but these other two sports, I don't think I can. So when Jackie came in in 47, I knew I had a chance to get into the majors. But all I had to do was just wait my chance, keep playing, keep playing, and I did, and I, you're right. When I look at the, the money that I was making, I said to myself, boy, when I see Jackie, I am going to thank him. And he's not going to know what I'm talking about, but I am going to thank him because he took such a beating for two years. He didn't fight. He didn't say anything, but he played ball for two years without saying anything. Also, we yeah. talked about Piper Davis and about Piper what, Davis. A, what a help. He really taught you how to play the game, didn't he? Will? Well, or taught you how to, how to think the game. I, I just finished to say, I knew how to play the game, but I didn't know how to play on that level because playing high school and going to Birmingham was another level. So Piper and I would sit on the bench sometime and we'd talk about if a guy hits a double, what will you do? And I said, I got to move him over. He said, that's right. Because the next guy, all he got to do is hit a fly ball. So I knew the, the, all the angles of how to play baseball before I even got to the majors. Mm -hmm. I went to Trenton. It was so easy at Trenton. I said to the guy, let me go to AAA because this is too easy. I'm wasting my time. So the guy said, no, you have to go to what they call a system in baseball when I came along. So I hit 354. And the reason I didn't hit more because they called me up and said, well, you can't win the band championship. I said, what good is my plan? So the guy beat me out by two points. And I said, good, that's fine. You can have that. Uh -huh. So I moved on. So it was, it was such an easy game to me when I was playing in Trenton that I, uh, a guy, we had a guy named Chick Genevieve was the manager. I said, Chick, let me just play my game out and let me enjoy. I said, I know you don't know how I can play. I said, but these guys are not on the same level because I just left a team that if you brought a team, that team that I left Birmingham, put them out here on the field, you guys wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> you know, that's how good these guys were. You know? And the way you thought the game. And, I, uh -huh. and, and during our last break, as an example, I'm talking to Willie about when I broke into the, uh, to the major leagues. And, mm -hmm. and every time I'd hit a ball hard to left center field, mm -hmm. Willie was there. Yeah. Every time I hit a ball hard to right center field, Willie was there, yeah. and I'm thinking, he, I mean, no man can cover that much. <laughs> yeah, but he he worked so in in tune with the pitching staff. Oh yeah, and oh, you yeah. told him what to do, and then he started telling me. I said, I, he said, I know you were all speed hitter. Yeah, and I I I, I thought you'd forgotten that stuff. Oh no, oh no, I knew every every team, uh, and I could tell you what every guy, how the guy would hit, when he would hit, and especially under pressure. I, I knew all that because mm -hmm. I, 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 I was tuned to baseball, and that was, that was my life. I knew everything. I, what we did, and I tried to tell a writer this one time, I said I would call the pitchers out in center field. He said, how would you call a pitcher? Now, he said, well, how can you call a pitcher? That, that means he thought I was calling every pitch. No. Mm -hmm. The pitch I want him to hit, I may say one. That's fastball. And I said, that's, that's the pitch I want him to hit. He can throw the breaking ball. He can throw a slide, anything he want to throw. But that one pitch, I'm going to set the defense up for that one pitch. And I said to the guy, that's how we play baseball. And that's what I did. Talking about the breaking ball, Dick Grote, uh, the great shortstop of Pittsburgh, and then he mm -hmm. came to the Cardinals in 63. Mm -hmm. He said, there's one guy in the National League that you do not throw a breaking ball to. Mm -hmm. And that's Willie Mays. Well, mm -hmm. about a month later, Bobby Shantz comes in, and Bobby Shantz had nothing oh. uh, primarily great breaking ball. He threw uh, one after another. I was on it. You <laughs> hit three home runs that day at Bush Stadium. You remember that day? <laughs> yeah. And two of two of them were off Bobby Shantz 
curveball, and I never heard the end of it from Dick Grote at the end of the game. We'll be back more with the great Willie Mays right after this. Willie Mays' glove is where triples go to die, said Dodgers executive Fresco Thompson, and none more prevalent than this catch in the polo grounds, yeah. 1954 World Series. Correct, yeah. And you say it's not one of the best catch, catches you've made. The 1954 World Series catch wasn't my best catch, but it was important because, as you remember, I think Cleveland won 111 games that year, right. and they had a tremendous uh, pitching staff. So my job was to make sure that nothing I now feel was, was, would drop. So when I'm running at this ball, I'm saying to myself, it was two guys on. I'm saying to myself, get this ball back into the infield. As you all know, in the polo ground, if you're on second base, you can score on a long fly ball to center field. And Larry Doby could run, and, and he, he was could a runner run. on at second. Right? I was told that Larry had went around third. He had to go back to second and still went back to third. He could run then. But anyway, when, I'm, when the ball was in the air, and I'm saying to myself, there's a wall here. I'm talking to myself as I'm running now. And, people don't, and I kept people this. And they said, no, you can't do that. I said, well, I'm, I'm talking to myself as I'm running, and I'm saying to myself, you've got to get this ball back in the infield because if you don't, somebody's going to score. So now, if you see this catch, I catch the ball, I stop. I'm throwing all in the same motion. I make what they call a 360 thing, mm -hmm. and I, when, I, when I catch it, I threw it, I end up in the same spot as I was throwing the ball, which is very difficult to do, you know, but I was young. I didn't know any different. I was, I was young, and I, I, all I could do is make sure I made the play. When you moved to San Francisco three years later, mm -hmm. what, what, what were your feelings about that? I mean, did you hate to leave New York? I hate to leave New York for a couple of reasons. I had just established myself in 1954, and I'm just started hitting the ball. I'm just, you know, I'm just killing the ball. Adjusting the polo grounds yeah, yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm just making myself uh, known all over the country. Now we move. Now I got to go to San Francisco. The first thing I hear, Willie Mays is coming to San Francisco. We don't know if he's that good. We don't. He got to show us. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I done played seven or eight years. Why do I have to show anything? So I made a mistake my first year out there. I hit 29 home runs, but I said, okay, I'll show them. I hit 348. Rich Ashburn beat me out by, I think, two or three points. He bunted it four times, and I called him up, you know, <laughs> to beat me out. But anyway, I, I, I changed my whole game. I, I didn't hit 30 home runs that year. So I said, the second year, why? Why am I changing my game for people that maybe don't understand how I play? So then the next year I hit 37, 38, and I moved on. So I started back playing my own game because I, I only hit 319 every year, 320. Uh, I didn't hit 348, but that year I wanted to hit three to show them that I could play. So I hit a lot of singles, a lot of doubles. I didn't hit a lot of home runs, but I only hit 29. But I know I could step on 29 without any problem. But that was, that was one of the things I had. I was kind of disappointed in myself. And, and after another 15 years, Willie Mays didn't have to show people in San Francisco that he no. could play. Mm -mm. And we had the soundbite uh, after the trade to, to the New York Mets and Willie's farewell speech at Shea Stadium. Yeah. With my farewell tonight, you would understand what I'm going through right now. Something that... I never feel that I would ever quit baseball. But as you know, it always come a time for someone to get out. And I look at the kids over here, the way they are playing, and the way they are fighting for themselves, tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. Willie May's philosophy about baseball was very simple. Willie said, they hit it, I catch it. They throw it, I hit it. Very simple. Incomparable Willie Mays has been my guest. I'm Tim McCarver. I'll see you next time.